All righty, so I'm um, Dodi Hage. I'm from uh, Merrock Energy IoT. With me is uh, Matt Herbster. He's from uh, Kite Pharma. And we're going to present to you one, basically it's a case study, one of, their, um, uh, one of their facilities on the East Coast out in Maryland. And uh, it's really just the benefits of monitoring based commissioning and its impact on, uh, on commissioning. Um, this is just some. ABC group stuff that we have to include, um, some credits that you can claim, and some other stuff. Um, course description, learning objectives, if, if you're claiming credits, not sure exactly how this works, but uh, basically it's really the uh, synergy between commissioning, EMIS, and, uh, um, and then also the uh, uh, impact of MBCX on, on the uh, commissioning. Agenda, uh, again, I'm Dodie Hage from Merrock. Uh, with me is uh, Matt Herbster from, uh, from Kite Pharma. Um, I'm gonna discuss the EMIS portion of it, and then uh, Matt is gonna jump in and talk about the case study, and then I'm gonna discuss the uh, impact of the EMIS uh, on the uh, commissioning. Um, just a quick review, this is straight out of Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Um, I'm sure many of you guys have seen this before. Um, an energy management information system is really um, this portion here. Can you see my cursor or is that not, not working? Um, so the first, the first part, you've got the energy information system, the uh, fault detection diag diagnostics, and then automated system optimization. Um, Merrock is all three of those. And then in addition to the uh, EMIS, services include you know, ongoing EMIS uh, review of the data and then corrective action verification. So you're basically your issues and resolution log. Um, what the, uh, the value proposition when it comes to commissioning is you have a bunch of commissioning tasks that you have to do. Uh, for example, collecting the data, trending the data, um, confirming, so point-to-point -point verification, um, uh, charting, fault detection. All of these, if, if you want to do this the old way where you're collecting, you know, you're downloading data from the BAS and then you have to upload that data, analyze it somehow, whether it's Excel or, or if you have your own server where you're running data science tools, it's very, very manual and it's not it's not cheap. Anytime you have to ask the controls contractor to do something for you, it's, it's just not cheap. Um, with an EMIS system, well, you have a lot of steps that's automated, including modeling the equipment, making sense out of the equipment. This is an air handler, this is a chiller, so on and so forth. So there, there's a lot of advantages when it comes to using, utilizing EMIS tools uh, for your commissioning efforts. And again, that's the value proposition right there. Um, I'm going to uh, give it to Matt to continue. How's everyone today? Uh, my name is Matt Herbster. I know he said my name a couple times, but I'll say it again. Um, I'm a senior facilities engineer uh, at Kite Pharma at our newest facility in uh, Frederick, Maryland, um, where I am the uh, SME for the uh, building management system and the equipment monitoring system. So, um, again, our facility is, is fairly brand new. Um, you know, we just went to occupancy in uh, May of, uh, 2021. So we're only about two years, um, you know, running. Um, we just got our FDA inspection, you know, and approval last year. Um, so we've been doing manufacturing production for only about a year. So we're as new as, as you, you could get. So um, in Frederick, uh, we have a two, about a 287,000 square foot facility. Um, that includes about 70,000 square feet of uh, admin space, 80,000 square feet of uh, manufacturing and QC, um, 25,000 of Central Utilities plant, um, and then we also have about 76,000 uh, square feet of shell space for future expansion. So a quick rundown of the HVAC equipment. We got uh, over 150 terminal units and uh, fan power boxes, um, three uh, hydronic uh, variable air volume air handling units um, that serve our admin and uh, non-GMP support spaces. Um, we have uh, three 
MAU slash EAUs with uh, heat recovery, uh, 27 exhaust fans, uh, three Dakin, uh, 1,000 ton uh, uh, magnetic bearing chillers, uh, four condensing uh, hot water boilers. Uh, it's not on here, uh, but um, two Cleaver Brooks uh, steam boilers, three cooling towers, uh, two turtle doves, and a partridge and a pear tree. So um, our facility is you know, fairly good size, um, but again, we have a lot of room for expansion. As you can see, like, like I said, for what we have, you know, our 1,000 pound chill or, you know, 1,000 ton uh, chillers are fairly big, but we also have sized that for, you know, that shell space that we're going to be using in the future. So uh, our EMS, EMIS implementation, why did we do it? Um, so when we came into it, we, you know, we were going for that LEED Silver uh, certification. Um, and uh, enrolling into a monitoring-based commissioning um, allowed us to attain credits um, to, you know, achieve that LEED Silver certification. Also, um, what we want to do as a facility is, you know, we want to get a deep dive into the health of our equipment. Um, do I have any facilities engineers here? Nothing? Okay. So, it's sad to say I know that, you know, I'm guilty of this too. I don't know if you are, um, but I'm just going to be... Uh, very broad. Um, facilities engineers, you know, we tend to be uh, uh, very surface level, um, you know, because we don't have the time um, or the resources to be able to take a deep dive into each of our equipment, be able to look at the operating parameters inside each, each equipment, like be able to really see the health of each of, our, each of our equipment. What are we worried about? We're worried about is our chill water temperature maintaining set point? Are we getting the correct differential pressure? Are we not getting hot and cold calls in our admin building? So, but we're not looking into each of those VAVs, you know, are they drifting out? Because there's so much t uh, data um, to sift through. Um, also, uh, the building management system might not be able to handle all that trends uh, that's involved with looking into um, each of the parameters inside of your equipment. Um, so we went to implement uh, the monitoring base uh, uh, commissioning. Um, so we had our first meeting um, a couple months after occupancy. Um, so uh, we got a meeting with uh, Doty here, and he had a list of demands. And those demands really wasn't too ter terribly difficult. Um, you know, we had to get sequence operations, which is nice because we, you know, just got our ass built um, from the controls, our controls as built. Um, we also had to give a lot of our um, um, operating parameter uh, documents uh, from all the equipment that we have on our site. Um, and then, of course, we had to get the list of all the uh, building management system points that, um, that, we, that we have implemented. Um, so that includes, you know, all the integration parts, you know, all the instance numbers, all the control panels, um, all the IP addresses and so on, um, so that uh, Melrock with, with Doty can go integrate um, viewing only into our system to be able to pull that data for us. Um, and then we also had to go over, you know, some, some different things um, about the sequence operation, about the different points that we have on our site, because, you know, obviously uh, sometimes with our air handlers, we got our heating, cool, heating set points, we got our cooling set points, we got our dehumidification set points. But sometimes those points get all, you know, put into a single discharge air temperature set point on our air handler. So we got to make sure that we tell um, Dodi about that part of, you know, um, the sequence operation so that once he comes up with the uh, default detection and the uh, rules that, you know, we're actually looking at the correct set points and things like that. Another thing, too, is, um, you know, with our, um, um, the way that we have our point naming convention on our, uh, on our uh, BMS points, you know, everyone has a different name for everything. You know, for example, low temperature detector. We call it an LTD for low temperature detector. Someone else might be able to call it, might be calling it a freeze detector, so they have FRZ. So we have to make sure that we get that information, you know, to him so that uh, once he makes the rules, you know, based upon the operating parameters and uh, the sequence operations, you know, he's getting the correct information. So after we got all the information, um, you know, we set up all the, that you set up all the uh, rules, 
um, based upon the uh, operating parameters of the uh, equipment and uh, the sequence operations. Um, you know, a month went by and then he comes back with me with 85 faults. And again, this is a newly commissioned facility and we already had 85 uh, faults right off the bat. Um, as you can see by the pie graph, um, a lot of it's our terminal unit uh, violations. You know, we got tab violations on our terminal units, excessive heating, um, stuck actuators and valves. Um, about a quarter of it also is um, sequence of operations uh, that weren't met up on our admin and our non-GMP support air handlers. It has to do with relative humidity, CFM, uh, and temperature. And then for you know our next case, uh, the case study that we're going to talk about in our facility are some of the chiller anomalies that we had. So um, when setting up the uh, chiller automatic fault detection, you know it's a mix of uh, operating uh, parameters, uh, tab, and generic. So the generic and tab rules are just your normal things like you know is your chiller turning on and off? You know when you say it is. Or the isolation valve is open, uh, being commanded to open up uh, when your chiller is on? Are they closing when the chiller is off? Is it maintaining the minimum uh, supply flow? Um, is it maintaining the condenser water flow set point of 30, 50 GPM? And then we get down into the nitty gritty of the chiller, um, the stuff that, you know, I'm not really looking at on a day to day basis. Um, so that includes evaporator pressure, you know, it should not drop down below 29 PSI. Um, evaporator approach exceeds a maximum of 1.5 degrees when the chiller is on. You know, condensing saturated temperature should not be less than 34 degrees. And uh, condenser pressure should not exceed 130 PSI when the chiller is on. So these are some of the rules that we have set up on that uh, monitoring based commissioning uh, to be able to run in the background. And then at the end of each month, you know, we have the meeting and we go over, over these faults. So, um, you know, this was going on for a couple months and then all of a sudden in January uh, 2022, um, we get the fault list. And one of those faults uh, was a high evaporator approach on chiller one. So as you can see uh, from the operating parameters from before, Evaporator approach, um, you know, should not exceed a maximum of 1.5 uh, degrees Fahrenheit when the chiller is on. And you can see that even with the one degree like fuzzy that we had on there, that it was well over the 1.5 degrees uh, um, uh, limit for the evaporator approach. So we go to Doty, we say, hey, what's going on with this, you know, you know, what do you think is happening? So he comes back, he says, you know, my recommendations, you know, we got to, you got to check for fouling as a possibility. Um, and then also uh, if, if it's not fouling, it could be a, you know, a refrigerant leak that we have on our chiller. So the first thing we did, um, we had our water tested for fouling and the water test uh, confirmed that the fouling was not an issue. Um, so the next thing was we did, we called up Dakin and they sent over their technician to start uh, testing for any kind of refrigerant leaks. Um, so he went through and he found a refrigerant leak on uh, one of the uh, temperature sensors on the well and it was slowly leaking from the chiller. So before I get any questions, yes, we do have refrigerant monitoring on our system. So we, had, we but this actually did push us to add another uh, refrigerant monitor underneath the chiller because we, we just had it on the front side and the back side of our chillers. Um, but our refrigerant monitor didn't pick up, our, our fridge, refrigerant monitoring didn't pick up any of this, any of this leak. Um, so once we saw that the refrigeration, that it was leaking, um, you know, we put in another ticket, had not come back in, you know, uh, we had to figure out how much uh, refrigerant that we lost. Um, so the way that they had to do is they had to remove all the remaining refrigerant out, weigh it out, and we weighed out about uh, 1,700 pounds of R134A, which is 1,000 pounds less than what we were supposed to have. So because of the leak was very slow, um, you know, we didn't really know exactly, you know, what it, came, what it stemmed from. It could have been, it could have came from the factory that way, or it could have been from, uh, you know, the construction phase. 
but luckily we, we were still under warranty. Um, you know, we had the uh, temperature well uh, fixed and, um, and we were able to put the refrigerant back in and get the unit uh, working again. So next month after when we did the fix, the next month came back and we were going through our faults. Um, and as you can see, uh, after it's been on, uh, chiller uh, one has been well underneath um, the evaporator approach limit of 1.5. So the importance of this monitoring-based commissioning, uh, especially for something like this, is that you know because we're looking at a surface level, we're we're looking at yes, the chiller is maintaining the temperature, the supply temperature for the manufacturing space, but we're not seeing that. You know, there's underlying conditioning uh, that's happening within that uh, within that chiller. Without this monitoring-based commissioning, we wouldn't have been able to see it, and we wouldn't have been able to detect anything until something possibly catastrophic would have happened to the chiller. All righty. So. What, why am I arguing that EMIS should be also a part of commissioning? Um, I think this one just highlights one of, the, uh, one of the issues. When you're commissioning, typically, you, you know, especially when it comes to um, VAVs, you're typically taking about 10, 15, maybe 20% sampling rate on the VAVs, and then you're going through those and then making sure, you know, are, are they working, are they, are they not working? So it's basically an, an issue of sampling. Well, I mean, you've got this site has 140, uh, about 140 VAVs. So you're, you know, a sample of 10, 15 percent. You know, that's it's it's not bad. Um, but once we connect, and whether it's sequence of operation or generic rules that we're that we're writing, whether you do it for one VAV or a thousand, it makes no difference um, for us. So we're collecting the data from the VAVs, looking at tab, we're looking at temperature, we're looking at sequence of operation, and you know, we're flagging, um, like these 15 VAVs, for example, were not, uh, I think these were violating um, temperature. They're out of uh, the temperature dead band. And I think we had other issues, right, tab and, and, and other things as well. So that's, that's one of the impacts, one of the benefits of, of an EMIS is, is that you're going to be looking at about 100% sampling rate on the VAVs, same thing with the chillers, same thing with the air handlers, um, and it's, it's a very quick process. It's not, it's, not, it's not tedious manual work, it's just automated work. That's, that's what an EMIS does. Um, and so that's one of the benefits. That's, that's why, we, you know, with our commissioning partners, they bring us in. I mean, some of them even bring us in at, on the design, design phase because, you know, they're interested to see like buildings and how they, they operate and, um, and, you know, take that experience and that input into the design phase. Uh, but in general, we come in during the construction, we connect, and the BAS, the the building automation system doesn't have to be complete. Like the last building I commissioned a museum that I'm currently commissioning, um, the GUI is not even ready. The graphical user interface is not ready. The workstation is not ready. Um, they set up the controllers on the uh, chiller plant. Um, and for us to connect to these controllers, it can be an iterative process. It doesn't have, you know, we don't have to wait for all the controllers to be ready. We know that the chiller plant has been tabbed and it's, uh, and, and it's on the network, so we commissioned the chiller plant, and we found air in the, uh, well, we didn't find the air, but we found that they're unable to meet tab, um, you know, flow, flow requirements, and then a little bit of digging, you know, one of the root causes is that you have air in the chilled water system, and sure enough, that's, that was what they found. Um, and so you're going iteratively through the process during construction, um, at TCF05, we didn't do that. We came in uh, during the um, operations and occupancy uh, phase. Uh, but with other, on other projects, we would actually go in during construction with our commissioning partner and, and um, you know, start the process of, of commissioning. And mind you, a lot of the issues that we find, um, you know, they're no, we're not on site. 
we're just, that's it. Our gateway is connected, it's on the network. And we're, we, you know, we run all these SOO-based, tab-based AFDD uh, algorithms, and we flag all kinds of problems. And then once you've, when, once you've flagged the issues, um, then, the, then the next step could be a targeted FPT. So now instead of randomly sampling 140 VAVs, you're saying these 15 v VAVs that need to be looked into further. So you can, you can, you know, what you end up with is 100% uh, sampling rate. And that's exactly what we did here. Flagged these, sent them over to Matt, and then Matt, um, you know, did his, you know, his FPTs on those VAVs and his troubleshooting. And, you know, you end up with 140 VAVs that are functioning the way they're supposed to be functioning. Nobody's complaining. Uh, you know, you're not getting any calls. You're not, you know, um, you know you're not being, um, you know, it's just not an issue. Um, the other impact that an EMIS has on commissioning is point-to-point uh, -point verification. The BAS um, con um, contractor, they have their own commissioning uh, of their BAS system, but, you know, you're the commissioning authority. You know, you, you know what, what, the quality of their work is not guaranteed. You're the, uh, well, you're not quality, you're commissioning, but I've seen it so many times where points are missing, uh, points are in the sequence of operation, and that they're just not found in the BAS. What we do is once we've collected the points from, from the controllers, and by the way, we connect directly to the controllers. We're not going through the database or anything like that. Once we have the points, and then we also have our fault detection diagnostics, we're gonna look at the delta between the metrics that are required for the fault detection and then the points that we see. And that, that delta, that difference is really just points that are missing. And we find you know, important points that are missing all the time. Um, as a commissioning authority, if you're coming in early on a, uh, on a project during the design phase, you can put a lot of these in the specs. You know, you can uh, let the contractors know that, you know, we're, we're, um, uh, that you will be looking at, for example, some numerics, not just inputs and outputs, but numerics, important numerics that are, um, that are, uh, that are included in the sequence of operation. And, and so if we cannot find that numeric, if we cannot find that metric, uh, then we cannot run our... Uh, fault detection on that particular sequence, and that's when the commissioning authority will go to the controls contractor and say, guys, you guys, you need to expose that point. This is done automatically. So the point-to-point -point verification for us is not, it's not a manual, uh, manual effort, it's, it's just automated. Um, issues in resolution log, so what this provides, so this is, a, this is an example. Um, what we produce are faults. We don't produce work orders. Then it's up to either the commissioning authority, the partner, or um, the direct, in this case, the direct customer. They're the ones who go into their CMMS system and, and input the work order, and then they're the ones that, that deal with their staff. What we do is we provide the faults. Um, and so with, with an issues and resolution log, um, like I mentioned, what we use this for is a lot of times for targeted FPTs. So instead of just a random sample, uh, you know, checking, checking equipment randomly or, or, going, or going by and checking 100% of the chiller, 100% of, um, of, of the air handlers, and um, just, it's, if you, do, if you don't do targeted FPTs, I mean, it, the, the process is very, very uh, time consuming. With targeted FPTs, you know for a fact what's broken, then you can go down uh, to that level, boots on the ground, and run your FPTs. And, um, and obviously, the other impact is seasonal testing. You know, once you're connected, once you know what the building design intent is supposed to be, and that's, that's reflected in our um, fault detection, um, then that's it. It's a continuous process. You can always uh, monitor and, and commission uh, the building. Um, I would, uh, so this is again, you know, from, from experience, I know uh, for a fact that we're reducing commissioning time and risk, you know, by utilizing, you know, our methodology where you're ingesting design intent, 
uh, as part of your fall detection diagnostics. You're reducing commissioning time, you're reducing risk. Um, what I've noticed is not just commissioning partners, but also MEPs on the, on the, on the, on the project. What, they, what we end up doing, what they end up doing is they end up leveraging the EMIS over the contractors. So you can go to the controls contractor and say, you're missing points, and you show them. Or your dew point set point is not resetting based on design intent, and then you show them the, uh, you show them the data. And even though they, you know, typically they make the claim that no, they've, they've already done their due diligence and everything works. And when it comes to controls, um, and I can't tell you how, how wonderful of a tool an EMIS is. Um, in addition to that, then you end up reducing time, uh, your time on site, which for a lot of companies, for commissioning authorities, for MEPs, that's, you know, that's, that's a cost. That's a huge cost. So, um, and then you increase the scope of deliverables. Again, you're not looking at 15%, 20% of the VAVs. You're looking at 100% of the VAVs. You're looking at every system that you're connected to. Um, you're looking at, um, if you want to do any MNV, um, you know, the EMIS comes ready with, with MNV reports that you can just generate with the click of a button. So um, you're increasing the scope, reducing the time, reducing the risk, and you're leveraging this technology over, um, you know, over the contractors. Um, and that's about it. Yeah, yeah. so that's it. We, we can take any questions you guys you guys have, yes, sir. So when you're doing your point to point checks, um, I can see how you pull the points in from the from the BAS. But well, how do you know what those points should be? So two things: um, we ask for an export file from the BAS. So not only it's mainly for quality control, and then the other thing is um, the other reason why we ask for for that export file is because a lot of times you end up with description. So sometimes if you see T. I mean, it could, it could mean anything, but if you see the description and, and, and our configuration engineers are going through doing their QA, QC, they're going to say, yeah, okay, that's, that's the supply air temperature. So that same export file then, um, then is, is then um, used. So first of all, you're looking at the delta between what, the points that we're picking up and then, and then that export file. If anything is missing, you know, are we not reading any points or vice versa? Uh, we're seeing more points, which is often the case. We see more points than what's, what's in the export file. Turns out, you know, after we've connected, they've added additional, additional points, and then they gave us the export file later. That's one situation. With the SOOs, when, when we have the fault detection diagnostics, the, our system is expecting, you know, three points for this SOO, right? You know, fif, you know 15 points for another SOO. And so those, those metrics, when, when the system generates, you know, the, the fault detection diagnostics, if you have a point missing, it's going to flag it. I have a point missing, I cannot run this, this uh, fault detection. And so that point missing goes into um, a spreadsheet, basically, and then you can take that spreadsheet to, to the controls contractor and say, I'm, I'm missing all these points. Yes. I guess my question is for Matt. And uh, I guess, Matt, did you find that doing a monitoring based commissioning in this EMIS that it's causing you to read? I guess, are you finding that it's causing you to do facility management in a different way than you've done in the past in terms of preventative maintenance or other? I don't know, just influence in terms of how you use your labor and the amount of technicians you've had to ha hire and things like that? Um, well, for me, um, because I'm, you know, for the BMS and, and EMS, um, you know, I don't do any of the hiring. Um, so I just look into the, and I write the work orders uh, that involved with these. Uh, um, and of course, you know, when we get these faults, you know, I got to rank them on, you know, the most severe, you know, what can we, hold off, you know, until, you know, next couple of weeks and things like that. So, yes, I do have to, you know, figure out, you know, what's going to be worth their time uh, when these faults come. 
Um, but no, we, it, it's, we haven't had any issues with that. Um, what we have found though is that, you know, we're getting the same, you know, that we did find is that we were getting the same faults on a lot of the things, especially with the VAVs, with the temperatures, um, and the sequence operation for our air handlers. Um, and they kept on coming in, coming in. You know, we're taking a look at these VAVs, the VAVs are fine. So the problem is that, um, you know, we have open offices, you know, things like that. Um, and we found that the, uh, the controls company uh, didn't link the VAVs together. So what they were doing is they were fighting against each other. Um, so it helped us to see and, you know, and plus with our sequence operation, we've, you know, even though it was commissioned, it was working, you know, for the most part, it was garbage. Um, so with these faults, it was able to allow me to show these, um, the faults to the powers that be that gives me the money to do projects and uh, be able to show that and leverage uh, that um, to be able to push the projects that I want. So we did a sustainability project um, that, um, that used the, uh, the sequence operation faults that were accounted for like a quarter of those, uh, those faults and then a lot of the VAV faults because they were, um, they were fighting each other um, to have an optimization um, linking the VAVs, uh, you know, together and optimizing those, uh, optimizing the uh, chill or the chill water, the air handler sequence, um, and it enabled us a huge savings just by doing that. So. So, oh, I, so going through these faults, um, you know, before I put the work orders in, um, you know, because uh, again, I'm building management system, so I went and looked at each of the the uh, VAVs and, and saw how they worked, and then you know, I was seeing, and I was seeing um, that, especially in the rooms, you know, where there were about you know two VAVs and a fan power box in there that, you know, we had a cold spot and a warm spot, you know, in the rooms and one VAV was was 100% heating, the other two VAVs were, were cooling. So they were fighting each other. So what I had, um, you know, as part of this optimization, I had the controls company come in, um, you know, um, and I let them know what I wanted um, and then had them link together uh, the VAVs so it would be minimal uh, fighting with each other in those rooms. And then same thing with the, um, um, uh, same thing with the uh, air handlers. You know, we showed them, you know, what, what's going on. We showed them the trends and things like that on our air handlers. And these are admin air handlers and, and uh, non-GMP support spaces. So we could do as much changing on those air handlers as we want for the most part. Um, so we went to a, um, an energy uh, company um, showed them the trends, you know, showed them what we have, and then they came up with the sequence for us uh, to more utilize the uh, um, the economizer. Um, what's that? Yes, yes. Hi. Um, I have two questions. The first one is in the earlier presentation there were the TAB defect has been found like less than 2%. I wonder how did you find the TAB uh, issue because the data that y you seems like got was the part load condition while the TAB is the full load condition. Wait, can you, can you say that? The so you have a pie chart. Yeah. So you've got the TAB issue. Tab? No, the tab. Tab. Tab, tab issue. So with the tab violation, um, so that means it wasn't maintaining the uh, uh, the CFM that we were uh, giving the set point to. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is the VAV system, the maximum CFM the TAB guys are measuring. I don't think you have reached that maximum because you are gathering the data during the part part load condition. So I wonder. They were over, over ventilation. There, there was an over ventilation problem if I remember correctly. I think they were going over the max. 
So they're oh, pushing see. more air than, than they need. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, in terms of uh, the room temperature unmet hours, I think there was like 50% of the time the, the cooling load was not met. But when I was looking at the set point, it was 68. So I wonder if that is the design condition and design temperature. No, because we were filtering for occupancy. So that's one of the, one of the filters that we applied is um, occupied hours. Um, and, uh, and then they, they have their own acceptance criteria as how, how many degrees off you have to be. Um, what we were showing in that table were averages. So you had, um, and then there I think it's like 5%. So less than 5% of the data has to be anomalous before we trigger the fault. Yeah, but, but however, the first VAV box, VAV206, says the maximum set point average is 68. And it is like 50% of the time it was above maximum, which means that it did not meet the cooling temperature. I don't think it is fair to decide it is not meeting because the temperature is too low. What we were looking for here is you've got, the, the way they had it programmed is you've got the temperature, then you have the max and the min. And what, what we were looking for in each row is basically, are you over the max or are you under the min? And either or conditions is going to flag it as an anomaly, and 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 then you have to be more than you have to be more than five percent an anomaly before. So I wonder if you recommended the owner or the occupants or tenants to change these things, because even for the offset temperature between the cooling and heating set point was less than one degree. Yeah. Which yeah. 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 I mean what. We do encounter ashtray violations and other things. I mean, you have to have a dead band that's a certain. Yeah, I mean, these, these are some of the things that you end up highlighting as part of the process, yeah. So I guess, can I, oh, I'm sorry. Can, using that same example with the 68 and 75. Can you I'm sorry. Into the microphone? Yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> oh, both of us. Um, going back to that same line, uh, that same line above, right, with the 68 space max set point average, and then the space temperature of 75 degrees, that created an alert, right? But it allows you to investigate that what that was, and like 68 is probably an unusual, you know, design cooling set point. So they're asking more than what the box could do, right? So I mean, it allows you to investigate, and then in the future change the criteria for that to not even have it alert? I mean, you yeah, can get so, to that I mean, level? A, a big part of the effort um, is, is to optimize, right? I mean, then you, ha then you start asking the question, like, you know, during, during our meetings, we were asking the question, well, you know, should you be at 72? Should you be at 68? What kind of, you know, wh wh you know what is this room? I mean, some of these VAVs may be, uh, well, not the VAVs, but uh, some other terminal units might be an, ele an electrical room. You know, do you really want to control an electrical room to 70 degrees? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's part of the process. Not, not only are we highlighting, we're just highlighting what's, what's deviating from the design intent, and then the next question is, okay, well, what optimization opportunities are there? You know, what's the use for that, for that space? You know, should it be at 68? You know, should it be at 70, you know? But yeah, that's, that's, that's an excellent comment, so. This is kind of a dual question for both of you. Um, so I guess in existing buildings, how do you um, alleviate uh, faults that are coming from uh, sensors calibration issues, um, especially on airflow calibration stations um, that have drifted over time? And then um, on the new build and on the ongoing side of things, uh, do you have some sort of program in place to uh, recalibrate your sensors regularly so that when we know that faults are coming in, are these actual faults or are they sensor issues, which right. are still faults but yeah. different? 
Yeah, so with a new construction, you have the advantage of setting that baseline. So let's say we want to use artificial intelligence um, to set the baseline on a sensor, right? Um, so you can, you can use artificial intelligence to say, well, your sensor is drifting. Um, or you can use ASHRAE 36, for example. They, they have some calculations that, 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 I mean, we have ASHRAE 36 as well that we use to check to see, um, you know, is your, does your sensor even make any sense? Um, when it comes to airflow, honestly, it's really difficult to see that your airflow, unless you have some, some opportunities and, you know, with the data, with the data sample that, that we're getting, for example, and I've seen this at another site of theirs, where the, 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 the supply fan slowed down and then the airflow shot up. So you already know there's a problem there. Um, when it comes to airflow, when it comes to CO2 sensors, relative humidity, I, I always tell all of our clients, all of our partners, I mean, that's gotta be a yearly PM. That's gotta make it on your yearly, yearly PM because airflow stations, um, uh, what do you guys have at RDMC, Eptron? The Eptron. Yeah, area. Eptron, yeah. Um, I, I can tell you, we don't trust data from any of them. So, you know, and especially if you have other mode, like other, like, like supply air static pressure and other things that, we're, that you're measuring, and then you're comparing to airflow, you flag it right away, you say, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, the nice thing about being connected to a new, to a new building is you, you have the opportunity to set that baseline. With existing buildings, it's really a lot of investigation. So not only are you looking for design intent violations, uh, but you can also apply, like we have ASHRAE 36 that we can apply on sensors to see if they're even calibrated. Um, so, that, so there are things that you can do to check without even being boots on the ground, but at the end of the day, when something violates a rule, um, you have to investigate until you find the root cause. We can often tell you what the root cause is, but many times we cannot. So someone has to go in and you, sh you, you have to run proper FPTs. So, is that, yeah. yeah. I think I got it. Yeah, there we go. Um, so with the chiller fault specifically and that evaporator uh, refrigerant leak, how are you calculating, are you even trying to calculate the avoided costs that come from that sort of early detection? Because again and again and again, when I'm promoting monitoring-based commissioning to clients, I say there will be lots of cost avoidance in this, but I have no way of quantifying, of applying that number. And my assumption is, my expectation is, that that's gonna be more than the energy savings. It is, well, yeah. So one, because you're connected to the VFD, right? Um, or the VSD on the, on the chiller, the VFD on the air handler, with that comes power, KW demand, and. Uh, all that stuff, that's easy, that's IP MVP. You, you know, here before your COP was like one to, one to three, whatever it might be, then after you fixed it, it, you know, your COP is four to eight or whatever, whatever it might be based on conditions. You can quantify that because, uh, you know, we have canned MNV reports, you can say here's your pre-period and then here's your post-period, give me all the savings. But you have other non, energy-related savings. I mean, imag imagine if a critical asset goes down for a pharmaceutical. You know, and, and that's where I think for them, their executives care more about the, that than they care about the energy savings from, from, a, uh, from some optimization or whatever it might be. So. I mean, I guess it's just the loss of the chiller, right? And then the time it, it takes for, you know, take it out, put it back in. And, well, I mean, I, t t technically... We, we didn't do yeah. the calculation on that. I'll, I'll tell you that up front. So. Yeah, because it would be chiller going down. It would be loss of utility of the space. So whatever operation that space is being used for, the guy's salary that would be in that space doing his job is getting paid for nothing right now. 
I mean, I don't know. I, it's a hard question to answer. I was hoping you might have some insight. It, it, I mean, you can, like, you, you can treat it the way you would treat a, a process where you're producing pencils, right? And then you're saying, per hour, it costs me this much to produce pencils. And then, but my profit from those pencils in that day would be X. And then if you're down for a day, you can calculate that profit. In a building, and you know, with most buildings, whether it's commercial, pharmaceutical, uh, your biggest expense is the salary. So you end up wasting time with, with people sitting down. I mean, you can calculate, you can say, uh, it would have taken two, three days for the chillers to, to be brought, brought back online. Um, so you take salary into consideration, then you take, well, whatever, because they have commodities that, you know, so you, you lose that, you have to throw away that commodity, that's, that's another cost. But I'd say that's going to be project by project basis. You know, it's very, you know, IP MVP is a standard, we use that standard. Anything beyond that is, is you know, it's going to, you, you know, as long as you show what the assumptions are, you show the methodology, um, I mean, you can skin that cat a million ways, so. Looking at this chiller example, just my question is how much more beneficial is it to be using EMIS than just having the BAS set up with alarming and trending? Because normally, you know, if you have a critical point going outside of a threshold, you have an alarm that goes to your building alarm page, and then you can mm -hmm. go and investigate. Yeah. So is this saving significant time? I'm just as what far, is the benefit you see? So um, with, with the BMS, you know, we're, again, like I said, you know, service level most of the time. Um, and then we have our alarming, uh, you know, that is real time. Um, even though that they do get data, you know, real time, they want to be able to know, I mean, just think about it. Well, like, it would be notified to them, they'd have to notify us, then we'd have to go out and do it. So with the BMS directly at our facility, you know, we're getting that, you know, immediately. We also have uh, remote notification set up on our, on our BMS if there's any kind of uh, um, critical alarm sets on its system. Is that kind of like what you're asking? Um, it, well, that makes it sound like it would be easier just to use the BAS. No. It's a, it's well, the problem is that, so are you talking about like with being able to monitor all these different points inside the, each of your pieces of equipment, as well as you know the normal stuff that you're trending and alarming as well. So a lot of times, it all depends on what kind of uh, building automation system that you have. You know, you're limited with how much memory you have in those control panels. So you have to pick and choose what you're going to trend and you know what you're going to look at. Um, so for us, you know we're going to pick that that status point on the chiller. You know, we're going to pick the load percentage. We're going to pick the, the flow, the, you know, the supply temperature. We're not going to be looking at the evaporator pressure, you know, or the high evaporator approach or, you know, um, the evaporator pressure and things like that. Yeah, you typically don't pick up those points. Uh, BAS is going to be looking at leaving chill water temperature, leaving chill water temperature set point, uh, DP, DP set point, that, that sort of thing. Um, does that? Yeah. So it seems like uh, during the controls verification process, um, during construction, that was kind of lacking. Um, and it sounds like you're still building onto the facility. Are you looking at adding this process during the new next construction phase or same old, same old? Yes. Yeah, we'll be adding this on and, and hopefully we'll be you know, as the new points come in for, you know, if we're building onto that shell space, we're going to have it built into the project that they must be, you know, once they do start doing point to point on their, on the control panels, we're getting that information to Melrock where they could process it and, and verify that data. Yeah. So, so. We, um, for Kite and then a few other uh, pharmaceutical plants and then a, a big hospital portfolio, we've created an enhanced MNV. And then that goes under either section 23 or section 25. So it's in the specs. 
and now you're in the design phase, everybody ex you, you know, knows what to ex that they need to expect this, and um, so that's another level where you're, you're really protecting um, the design intent. You know, you're going to get what the design says, and in that you add acceptance criteria. You know, no more than 10% of the data, no more than 5% of the data. You know, for this space it's 5%, for that space it's 10%. 10%. You, you literally you list it, you list all those in the specs. I think was it section 25, 70, you know, 71, whatever, whatever it might be. So M and V, um, and then depending on who it is you're dealing with, if so, we have an, a huge MEP um, that puts us in their specs, and that goes under section 23 because they're HVAC. Um, with, uh, with them, I think it'll be probably section 25 because we're more interested in the controls than, you know, because you capture the controls, you capture the eight, you capture everything, so. Yep. Yeah. So y'all's EMIS system, it can interface with various front ends, tritium, yep. Metasys, and all that. We're we're in hospitals. Let's say you have JCI, Schneider, Siemens. Um, I mean, we're pretty data agnostic. We have open ADR stuff on the same exact you know pipeline. Um, microgrid stuff, so we're controlling dispatchables, you know, so you're reading stuff from the BAS, uh, you're reading stuff from the utilities, and you're controlling dispatchables just based on, you know, so it, it all depends on the program, but yeah, it's the same pipeline, the same gateway that's gonna be interfacing with. Uh, Is it like using like REST API, HTTP, how, how are you guys pulling that data? From the utilities? Uh, just from the overall BAS system? No, from the BAS, it's your connected BACnet. So you're pulling data directly from uh, from the controllers via BACnet, BACnet IP. IP, okay. Yeah, yeah. So what if it's like a system that's MSTP? So, I mean, that's that's also, if it's BACnet, whether it's MSTP or IP, it's easy, because that's okay. just your, you know, if it's MSTP, you just need to expose the points, and that's, that's typically easy. Um, we also have a partner in Canada, um, so let's say you have OPC, some OPC, you know, they have gateways that will go OPC to BACnet IP or, um, but for, for us, native for us is just going to be Modbus, BACnet, uh, Pulse, um, some wireless stuff like Zigbee. Uh, I mean, these are standard, but, you know, when it comes to the more, like, lawn works and OPC and a million other things, uh, we'll just install a gateway that will go that communication to BACnet IP. Once it's on the network, you're done. I mean, you know. Thank you. Have you ran into issues with firewalls from owners? I mean, you, you got to work with IT, and if IT, um, you know, it, it can be challenging when IT doesn't necessarily understand their network very, very well. Um, but you work with them, you work with them, you work with them, and then you know they'll. It's it's literally a five minute job to connect us to the network. It's this MAC address tied to this port on that switch. So if your IT is, is um, I mean, we have like hospital portfolio, like these guys, hospitals, it's a five minute job, you know? Oh, yeah, with, <laughs> but I, I know what you're saying. But I, I've got clients right now that. Yeah, no, I know, I know what you're saying. They won't let you touch nothing. They're, when they finally do, their firewall kicks us out a month later. Yeah, so these are all... Like, well, we didn't have nothing to do with it. We approved yeah. you, but... Yeah, I mean, these are IT settings. You have, you have multiple firewalls. You got fire... Like, you have, a, you have multiple firewalls in the, in, the, in the cloud. You have two or three on the gateway. Then you have the owner's IT firewall, so they all have to mesh. So the right ports have got to be open, so on and so forth. But that's, that's just all IT settings. I don't think anybody can, can do anything about it. An industrial like Boeing and, uh, and, and others where you're just manufacturing, you're not allowed at all on the IT network. Um, we have a, a, a cellular modem solution where it's the same process, but instead of their network, it's just cellular and um, one minute data, no draw. I mean, it's, it's pretty good. Um, yes, sir. 
Hey, Daddy, so I wanted to expand, wow, that's hot, on the uh, BAS alarming question. So working a lot with facilities operations teams, we know alarm fatigue is a real thing. Yep. Right? And so, you know, let's say you walk on a, a campus, they don't have an EMIS solution, but they've got 90,000 unacknowledged alarms in their BAS. How do yep. you, how do you approach, and it's a, that's a real scenario, yep. how do you approach that where you don't just replicate 90,000 other alarms or, yeah. or failures and then also compound that by adding the additional points that you're, you're pulling in yeah. as well. So one of the biggest reasons why you get a lot of alarms, and even if it's an EMIS that is poorly configured, is you're running a lot of um, you know, generic alarms. And you hook up uh, in EMIS, not not ours, somebody else, because I've seen that because we've bumped other uh, other people off off a job because they produce 2,000 alarms. Commissioning agent goes through it, um, and then out of 2,000, 100 might be okay, and then 50 would be something that you would prioritize and then push forward into work order, uh, into work order system. For us, the biggest thing and the biggest impact is design intent. We got our hands on the, on the control submittals. This is the sequence of operation. We write the code based on that sequence of operation. Now you have AFDD that's based on your design intent. You violate that, that's not going to be a worthless alarm. BAS systems, they're not, they're not looking at operating parameters. You know, we're looking at operating parameters. They're not looking at design intent. Well, they technically, on, on to some level, they are, maybe. But I understand your, your point of view, but it's just the controls. It's a contr and, and, it's, and it's not a good controls. You should read LBNL stuff about, um, uh, about building automation systems. They're not necessarily, um, and then your BAS is as good as the installer. Literally, whether it's communication between the controllers or whether what's inside, they have an awesome standard in, in, in creating BA, but, but they're not, they're atypical. You know, we go to a lot of places where the BAS systems, you have um, controllers offline. You know, from the export file, I know I'm supposed to see BACnet ID 2011. We don't see BACnet ID 2011. You know, then their controls um, engineers go on site and then they, they check, well, the controller's been offline and no one has a clue. You know, BAS didn't alarm. Um, so um, for us, we don't have any wasted alarms, to be honest with you. And one of, one of the biggest reasons why we don't is because it's, we, you know, we're going straight out of the design intent. So if something alarms there, there's a problem. And that's why you end up with 85 alarms and not 2,000 alarms. So How do you prioritize that's all, that, that all depends on, on either the uh, direct, so in this case it was the direct customer. The direct customer, you know, you just go through with them. So when we first met, our first meeting was an hour and a half. Now our meetings are five minutes. Yeah. That's basically how you doing, Matt? Pretty good, yeah, there's, everything looks good. Awesome, bye-bye. You know, so. Um, if it's the commissioning authority who's our partner, then it's up to the commissioning authority because then it's commissioning authority that's interfacing with, with, with their client. It's not our client, it's theirs. Um, with our direct, like with Kite, that's our direct customer. We sit down with them. What do you guys, you know, do you guys, you know, I recommend we look at the chillers. I recommend you, this is important, take this, take these data, go to Dakin, make sure that you know, they, they check this stuff out and, um, and so, um, but it's a process, you know, so it's, it's a process post AFDD and that's, that's critical by the way. Who, who you partner with, you, you, you have to always check what's the process, what's the support post AFDD, so. trips off or whatever are you still you know if your air handler trips off or your chilled water is above temp and then you have what I see a lot in both BAS alarming and monitored base commissioning is then all of your VAVs are throwing faults and sparks and you just have hundreds of them yeah so do you have internal rules where if a major component of the system is already 
failed or an alarm, it prevents all of the nuisance alarms? Yep. Okay. It's associations, basically, functional associations. If your chiller is malfunctioning, well, you're going to see everything alarming downstream. Um, and um, we're very, when it comes to real-time real rules, real-time alarms, we're very, very careful in, in what we choose, how we choose it. And again, it's a process. You have to talk to the owner, uh, make sure that, uh, and, and when it comes to kite, when it comes to uh, customers like that, the owner is already very sophisticated. And that's, that's something that, that I should highlight. The owner already knows what they want, what the issues are. The owner knows the BAS limitations. Uh, they understand the limitations of you know, traditional commissioning where you're, it's not monitoring-based commissioning. Um, so they already, they're knee-deep in you know, running facilities, so they know these, these issues. So with Kite, when I met with their director, um, what was Neil, was he director of facilities? Yeah. Um, it was, it, the real-time rules were limited to, I think, three. That's it. Three rules that were very specific. And actually, I'm, I apologize, I'm blanking on what they are now. Because I, I, they're running on the back, uh, you know, versus all the other stuff that you see is something that we, we meet about every month. So you, you, we have the ability to, to you know, email you when something, something catastrophic um, or something catastrophic is about to happen. So some of these real-time rules are actually predictive maintenance and not necessarily, uh, you know, too late maintenance, <laughs> so. Good. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you all.